Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to The Opportunistic Trader. We're now joined by author, trader, and entrepreneur Steve Burns, who's been investing and trading in the stock market successfully for over 20 years. Uh, he's the author of 17 books about trading and the stock market. Uh, Steve and his wife, Holly, are founders of New Trader U, where you'll find a wealth of knowledge on trading and the markets. Uh, Steve will be talking with us today about what he's learned from, you know, reading and learning from so many uh, amazing traders uh, throughout the years. Um, you know, he's spoken and learned from tons of top traders, too, at his new Trader U, um, speaking with a lot of novice traders who are just getting started out. So, Steve, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? Hey, doing great this morning, Mike. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, interesting markets, a lot of volatility out there, which is uh, makes for good trading environment for traders. Yeah, the uh, intraday traders have plenty of uh, moves moves to trade at this point in time. Oh, yeah. I mean, days like yesterday, uh, there were tons of uh, moves out there. I think yesterday we had over a 100 point move in the S&P. So um, a lot going on. So that's a good time to be talking. Uh, you know, I wanted to talk to you about a few different topics today. Um, first, I know as an author, you study uh, t tons of the top traders, whether it be the market wizard traders or, you know, traders that are really uh, documented in books and you've really done a lot of research. And so I guess the first question is, from all your reading, you know, what are the one or two of the most interesting traders that have been, uh, you know, very successful that you've uh, learned from? Uh, yeah, Richard Wiseman and Tom Basso are uh, two, two friends that I uh, interact with a lot. And uh, it's it's fascinating. You know, they both live a, a very, uh, you know, they don't have the Lamborghinis and the poolside uh, videos. They live very uh, conservative lives and uh, multimillionaires. And, and by all by all purposes, they're really retired or semi-retired. They can do whatever they want to do and they continue to trade anyway. And, uh, you know, the real traders in life are a lot different than a lot of stuff that we see on uh, social media. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, but in terms of their technique and I guess the mental approach to trading, are, are there a few things that stick out that really have, uh, you know, that, you know, have you yeah. studying these guys? Yeah, they have a consistency. That's the thing that so many of the novices, when they start out, I think it's, they say 90, 95% of uh, new traders fail, which is uh, something that I've seen also tracking with real new traders is so many, they don't have the, the, first of all, they don't quantify what they're doing. And then if they if they do, they don't have the discipline to stick to it. And, uh, you know, Richard Wiseman, Tom Basso, they're just they're very disciplined. They have a quantified system that they follow regardless. And they're not as emotionally moved by losing streaks or drawdowns. They continue to follow their process. And almost all the traders I've studied, you know, especially with the great works by uh, Jack Swager and Michael Covell for uh, vetting the top traders in the world over the past uh, several decades, is uh, they all have, they all create some basic same principles. They all manage their risk carefully. They all have the right position sizing. They create good risk reward ratios, and they trade a robust, quantified system for the most part. Yeah, um, and do you get a sense with it they've changed with the environment, or is it the sort of thing where they had a system and they kind of stick to that system in all different environments? I see that they've all have the systems, but I see they're always trying to improve. They're always all the traders, the top traders are always looking. They keep their core principles the same, but they evolve and adapt and they try to improve their system. So they might try to make their losses smaller or their wins bigger or adjust for volatility or, or add markets that they trade. So I think they're always improving, but sticking with the same core principles that got them there. Is there anything you find kind of surprising about their tradings that you've read about? Uh, you know, the drawdowns and, you know, when you first start out, you just think of these uh, uh, people being right high percentage of the time if they're market wizards. But in reality, it's really the big wins. It's the, it, the winning percent a lot of times can have little to do with the actual profitability. Uh, even in my own trading, it's not those big winning years and, and trends that really just the huge wins is what makes you profitable more than being right a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So you've been studying a lot of different traders, a lot of different uh, trading strategies. You've written 17 books. What are some of the trading strategies that you've learned from some of these guys that you kind of implement in your trading and in your teaching? Yeah, for me, I, I trade the stock market primarily with also some option plays. Uh, but the alpha in the stock market really comes from the uh, big bull markets and the indexes. So what I found fascinating was, you know, so many trade the indexes like the SP 500 uh, because that is where the alpha is all of it's generated from the indexes because 
you know, people think of it as passive investing if you just buy and hold. But the reason buy and hold investing works for the vast majority of people is because the indexes always have the winning stocks coming in, the losing stocks going out. In the stock market, the alpha, it's, a, it's close to the Pareto principle where 80% of the returns come from 20% of the stock. So you either need to find the leading stocks or you need to be in the indexes. And the way to filter the trends of the stock market primarily is through moving averages. Moving averages can filter the volatility and, and tell you when to get in and out as a uh, technical system. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Are, are there certain setups that you look for uh, on a technical basis? Are you the sort of guy that looks at moving averages or you know, what sort of indicators do you uh, find most relevant right now? Yeah, some of the, the key systems I have, a lot of them are the 10-day, 50-day uh, moving average crossover system for several markets. Also, the 200-day moving average is a big filter for me for the long and short side, along with uh, pullbacks and uptrends to the 200-day moving average are the RSI, a 14-period uh, uh, RSI. A lot of times, the 30 RSI will hold during uh, uptrends as they oversold buy signal. Gotcha. And then I saw uh, from some of your books, uh, you used to or maybe still do trade uh, the DARVA system. Uh, I had never heard of the DARVA system. Can you tell me uh, about the DARVA system? Yeah, Nicholas Darvis, I think, really has a place in, in trading history. Uh, he's one of the very first what evolved into called the trend followers, you know, like Jesse Livermore and uh, uh, Richard Donchian made popular and it evolved into Ed Sakota. But but Nicholas Darvis was one of the very first people that traded based on price action alone. He created one of the very first price action systems where he looked at stocks, the strongest stocks in ranges increasing on volume. And then he would buy the breakouts of the ranges. So he would be in the winning stocks. And in the 19, uh, late 50s, early 60s, he ended up making over $2 million back in the 60s by uh, being in all the leading stocks during a strong bull market. And really set a lot of the stage for even like the investors business daily systems for uh, the can slim stock filtering system and, uh, you know, trading momentum and trends. Do you get the sense, though, with the, you know, the increased technology, the way that, you know, earnings are uh, released and the way market reacts after earnings? Do you think that sort of system still works today or can any of the process of what he was doing be applied? I, the the principles he had was sound with the way he would pick the stocks that were changing the world and had an edge from a business standpoint, which would cause it to go in volume and then trend. The, the, his big overreaching principles are actually absolutely spot on, but the volatility uh, in today's market with the cheaper commissions and uh, the high frequency traders and the speed of the market uh, has has made it where you need a better filter for volatility for trading the Darvish system. So I think a lot of it, you know, you, you change his uh, ranges with crossover systems and uh, moving average crossover systems and uh, moving averages and find other ways to filter the volatility. But, you know, it's all about capturing a strong trend in a, in a market. Yeah. What other sort of, in the 17 books that you've written, what other sort of um, signals or trading strategies have you written about that you think are most pre prevalent today? Yeah, I think a lot of it right now, really, the you know, I, I cover risk management position sizing along with the right psychology for trading, which is crucial. You know, it doesn't matter what your system is, you know, based on your uh, risk management or psychology, you're going to be ruined by, for other reasons. But, uh, you know, I think the risk management right now in this market, the position sizing, you know, is crucial when the volatility is so high, you know, and the, uh, the discipline and psychology. So if your system has gone out of favor to be able to trade smaller and smaller during losing, losing streaks and staying in the game, I think actually the risk management principles are the most important in this market as well as when we, for, for bull biased uh, traders, you know, when we get back over these long-term key moving average, like the 250 day and the 200 day to, to not miss it when, if this is the end of the correction, not to miss the upswing, because this is where a lot of the money is made after uh, markets like this. Yeah. And like you said, I think risk management, especially on a day like yesterday where the S&P is over 100 point range, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are probably 50 different trades on a day like yesterday, whereas sometimes, you know, two months ago we were seeing a six mm -hmm. point range in the S&P. Um, you know, there's tons of different moves. You just got to keep your stop. And, you know, if your stop's elected, uh, look for the next trade, uh, but move on, that sort of thing. Yeah, you got to keep your uh, if you're on the right side, stay right for as long as possible. You're on the wrong side, be wrong quickly and get out, you know, and just, uh, you know, keep your losses small and your wins big. And that's where profitability comes from. And you get caught on the wrong side of this market. You can be really hurt really fast. Yeah. Um, you know, 
You were mentioning before you've been trading for uh, quite some time. Uh, you've traded through a lot of different market environments since you've been trading for over 10 years now, nearly over 20 years. What do you think has changed and how do you adapt to, uh, you know, the change, um, I guess, over time with, com you know, technology, systematic trading, things of that nature? Uh, when you're talking to traders at, I guess, New Trader U, you know, what do you tell them about the current market environment versus the way it was 10, 15 years ago? I think everything happens a lot faster now. What used to take months to happen can now happen in a week. And what used to take a week can happen in a day now. I think the speed has dramatically increased with uh, the technology and the speed of executions and the low cost commissions. So everything just happens a lot faster now. So it can be uh, easier or more difficult if you get on the wrong side now and you don't, you know, very dangerous to be on the wrong side, have a stop loss, ignore it and uh, let it keep going because now the losses can be a lot bigger, a lot faster. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what surprised you most about, you know, I know at New Trader, you you have uh, basically classes and courses for young traders or not, uh, or I guess uh, inexperienced traders. What um, do you have a lot of interaction with those uh, traders? And if so, like what sort of uh, uh, topic of conversation has there been recently with all this volatility? Yeah, a lot of it's uh, doing nothing. A lot of my people, you know, it's, you know, for well, doing swing trades and long side trend trades, a lot of it now, the, the best p position has been cash. And a lot of them, actually, the risk management teachings and the psychology has kept a lot of them safe, where in the past, they might have want to try to catch a falling knife and get, get on the wrong side of it and lose a lot of money. So a lot of it right now is it's really quiet. Everybody's just waiting to see when we uh, we stabilize and we get a reversal or we go into a bear market. So it's a lot of waiting and seeing with a lot of impulsiveness. You know, they're, they're actually waiting to see if their signals are triggered. They're not just trying to figure out what's going on and predict it and uh, and chase something. You know, they're now following quantified processes they've developed. Yeah. Uh, I guess a different question on the uh, more Twitter topic. I see you on Twitter all the time, and I just wonder how do you tweet so much and so much like good information? I mean, I think of two or three things maybe a day. You've got two, you know, five uh, different uh, tweets every hour with great information. How, how do you stockpile it all and get it out there? <laughs> Yeah, a lot of it's just a flow of thought, you know, as I'm as I'm sort of like, you know, um, to me, like trading is sports, like other people love to get into sports or their other hobbies. You know, that's my my game, my sport, my hobby is, is trading. So a lot of it's a stream of thought as I think things, you know, I'll send them out or if I'm writing a book, I'll send out tweets from the book. So it's really a I'm pretty engaged with the markets most most days. And if I'm not actively trading, then I'm researching, back testing and, and writing. So it's just a flow of, flow of thought from from working every day. Yeah, no, it's amazing. I see different quotes or historical quotes or this or that. There's always something interesting. You got a lot of uh, a great news feed uh, over there. Uh, you know, you speak with on Twitter a lot of interesting people, a lot of traders. It kind of brings your community together with all the traders. Um, what what do you find most valuable? Like who you know, following what sort of people and what sort of information? How do you filter through all the nonsense? Yeah, I think for me, you know, especially when I started all my research, uh, you know, of 14, 15 years ago, I really got serious on the research side. And and I think uh, for me, Jack Swager, you know, he did our vetting for us. I think, you know, one of the market wizards yourself pretty well, but, you know, he vetted the market wizard. So Jack Swager's writings gave me a good core to start with, knowing they were vetted properly, along with uh, Michael Covell's trend followers. You know, they did the research on the guys that had the big records and returns and made the money and managed funds successfully. So that's a great place to start. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the current market right here? Uh, S&P is trading 26.50, we're up seven on the day, NASDAQ's down four. We've been all over the place in the past 24 hours, up, down, left, right. Uh, what do you think we're thinking heading into uh, elections next week, uh, big earnings week this week? Uh, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, highly, highly dangerous, highly volatile. Uh, looks like we're not going to really have a resolution to after the elections are over and we see what the results are before people know what side to take. This is just a lot of uh, the reflection. It reflects the uncertainty for the future right now with so many things going on. I think we're going to have to wait till the election night to really see which way we're going to go from here. But we are in a correction. So next step is a bear market if we can't pull it pull it together by the by the elections. Yeah. What sort of uh, do you do you look at all different global markets? I know you were mentioning equities before. Do you look at different correlations or anything you're looking at at the moment to cue off of? 
Yeah, no, I, I focus. I really focus on the U.S. stock market because it's it's it generally runs about half of the world's market cap, and the real the alpha that the buy and holders get really from the uh, leading stocks in the U.S. stock market. So I really stay focused on the the U.S. stock market and the leading stocks there. And right now, the leading stocks are under heavy distribution in the stock market. So that, that it's really bad signs right now. A lot of repair that we have to do before we can even consider some really good long term uh, long side plays. Steve, hey, it's Larry Benedict. Hey, Larry, great to talk to you today. Yeah, you too. Thanks for joining us. Um, I just had one question. I have a number of different questions, but I have one thing that's like been sitting with me for literally at least a weekend till today, and it's this this comment that is going out on on media and uh, obviously on CNBC as as well as other stations about a correction, and they're they're. They keep saying, you know, we're in a correction, market's down 10%, but really, like, I've been doing this for 35 years, okay? And not once has anyone ever said to me, even running a fund, if I was up 30 for the year and I went plus 20, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I mean, that's not really any pain or, or correction or, or, or anything because you're still up 20. My thought is the real correction comes when the market goes negative 10 you know, they're going to say at that point we're in a bear market and we're only going to be down 10, you know, 20 off the all time mm -hmm. high. And I don't know if you look at that at all or if you've mm -hmm. ever, you know, like, ha would you consider us to be in a bear market if the market trades down 20 from the ultimate high tech? Or are you looking at it down 20, you know, on the year type of thing? You know, market was up about eight. So I was just wondering if you had any thoughts on that, because I think it, you know, it. It, it makes people feel more complacent, you know, because they're thinking, oh, well, we're in a correction. Maybe it's time to buy. But I don't feel like we're in a correction yet. I mean, this is a correction, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's, you know, if we go down 20 percent from the high, I don't I don't know if you categorize it as a bear market. I didn't know what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I always uh, I, I guess, you know, I measure from the high. So I like I do anchor to the 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 equity high, but like you're saying, if, if a hedge fund's up 30% of the year, then they, they draw down 10%, they're still up 20% of the year. So that's not negative. Yeah, my concern is the buy and hold investors who've had all their gains wiped out over several months with a 10% correction when the uh, index is the SP 500 goes negative on the year. You know, I think that a lot of that volume comes in with people that thought they were buy and hold investors panicking out. So I do like to quantify from the, uh, the highs because I think that's where people start getting their emotions triggered as well. But, uh, right, like but let's just hypothetically say I didn't open my statement, which most people, you know, not, not our community, you know, of <laughs> traders and hedge fund managers and whatever, but the community of people like my mom who <laughs> doesn't know what she owns <laughs> and doesn't really open the statement. My, my thought is if, if you really didn't look at your statement this year, okay, which, you know, people do, you're not really down. I mean, Amazon is still up 30% for the year, even though it's yeah. gotten an, annihilated. And, you know, Netflix is up, what, 40, Mike, 45? Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 you know, there hasn't been any pain in, in those names. So, you know, I, I just think there's so much more on the, on the downside coming here. Um, mm -hmm. People are overinvested. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just didn't know what, how you looked at that type of uh, gauge you know, the, the correction gauge or the bear market. So, you know, like literally we're going to be 10% down on the year, basically 20% from the all time high. Okay. And that's going to be considered a bear market. And we're basically going to be in the low that we were in February when we weren't mm -hmm. in a bear market. So that, that's the only thing that I look at. Like, you know, these are levels mm -hmm. 2,500 on the uh, S and P was seen mm -hmm. or, uh, earlier this year. So, you know, if we get there, we're in a bear market, but it's been seen already. So again, that's just my thought, yeah. but, uh, yeah. you know, but I, I appreciate it. What is, what is your, what is your favorite market to trade? Uh, really, the SP 500, the SP 500, the index, the uh, leverage ETFs, the uh, options are so liquid on the SP 500. I really like the diversification and the slower moving of the index, but you can apply leverage to it. And really, that is what the buy and holders really get their uh, gains from is the index is the SP 500 and other extent the Russell 2000 because they have the winners. They act like the SP 500 is passive when in reality it is a managed system. 
they they let their they get their losers out of the index and they bring in the winners systematically. Yeah, I mean that's actually my niche. I'm you know I've been trading S and P's actually since 1984. Um, and, uh, my first fill in S and P's, I'll tell you where it was. You'll, yeah. Are you sitting down <laughs> under a hundred? Okay. So, <laughs> so, you know, I've been doing it a long time and I like what you're saying. You know, I like the liquidity of it. I like the options you can do futures yeah. options. You can do OEX, you can do SPX, you can, you know, you can get options on at many multiple different levels, whether it be futures options or you know, equity uh, indices. Um, it's a most purely moving thing. Mm -hmm. You don't get taken out by, you know, like one or two stocks moving a certain direction. It's it's yeah. very pure. And, and I think it's the best trade on the board. And like you said, with the options, I mean, you could do anything you want. I mean, yeah. literally anything you want. There were a few times, you know, like yesterday, like when we went down hard quickly, you know, markets dislocated a little bit, but then they come right back in line. So, you know, I, I agree with you. It's the best trade. I also yeah. like crude oil. I don't know if you trade mm -hmm. crude at all, but that's, uh, you know, that's a really good mover. Um, you know, but S&P for sure is, uh, is the uh, market of choice. Yeah, I like that you can also backtest the index, like the S&P more consistently because it's an index. You can't really backtest individual stocks because they go through so many different distribution and accumulation phases and some leave and never come back. But the index always uh, comes back with the, with new companies that are uh, growing earnings. So I like the, the backtesting possibilities with the S&P as well. Great. Uh, so, Steve, uh, I know you started uh, New Trader U a few years ago, and you've uh, e-courses and uh, you know a lot of different things on the the site. Tell me about, uh, I guess, New Trader U. What you're doing there? Yeah, I really, you know, after reading uh, over 400 investing and trading books, you know, I kept, thinking, you know, I just got to the point. I read so many, I thought I would just start writing some. It, it's just as therapeutic for me to write the books and to do the blog and to do the e-course. It really even helps me. Some of my best trading is after launching a new book when I've really dug in really deeply to really quantify, you know, the principles uh, operating uh, trading business profitably. So uh, it's, uh, it's just something, you know, you know, what else, what I do watch TV, you know, I enjoy the creation of, uh, of the educational materials. Yeah. And then you've uh, been doing it for a while. So I guess you have all sorts of different courses I saw on there. Is it uh, range from technical analysis to fundamental analysis or, you know, what's, what's the most popular? Yeah, I, I don't do fundamental analysis. Uh, the only thing I really use that for is a stock watch list to create a watch list with. But, uh, you know, my e-courses have different ones explaining the basics. It's really one on one courses. It's really where somebody can go get started, where all the new traders can go to get a get a shortcut and get started, not have to go through hundreds of books. You know, if I would have read the right uh, 10 trading books to begin with, I wouldn't have had to read but 10. So you know, I try to give a shortcut and cut through all the uh, filler and, and get to the point of the principles that lead to profitable trading. And I hit it from uh, from several different angles with uh, technical indicators and position sizing and principles and back testing. So a lot of uh, basic uh, principles covered there for a real good entry. Gotcha. Anything new coming out on New Trader U or, uh, you know, everything uh, that's there right now people can expect and uh, that sort of thing? Yeah, I, I launched uh, the backtesting e-course is relatively new. A bunch of great feedback with that. Uh, backtesting a lot, primarily indexes with moving averages and, and really showing what worked in the past. I just released a book yesterday called uh, The 50 Moving Averages of Beat, Buy and Hold and really just shows 50 backtested moving average systems that would have, would have beat just buy and hold. You know, so many people just hold to those nasty bear markets, even for mainstream uh, retail investors and, and traders. And they'll find signals and tell you when it's time just to get out and when it's time to get back in in a quantified way. So what are those uh, in the book? Uh, spoiler alert. What are uh, two or three of the biggest uh, moving averages that have been the most successful? Oh, my gosh. The, uh, well, the, the, really, the 200-day end-of-month uh, spy signal for the SP500, that is one of the best filters for uh, bear and bull markets. If the spy price closes under the 200-day moving average on the last day of the month, you know that has got you out of uh, the, the worst uh, bear markets of the 21st century. It almost, uh, I think, it triples or quadruples the returns of a buy and hold by getting you out by the end-of-month signal. Uh, another one is just the 250-day uh, uh, moving average on the QQQ ETF 
as just an end of day signal. You know, it has one or one percent losses when it, it's a fake break, but when it does break, that also got you back in after the internet bubble and after the 2008. So, uh, 250 day end of day for the NASDAQ 100 QQQ is another great one. Uh, what's the name of the book that that uh, just came out yesterday? Uh, 50 Moving Averages That Beat Buy and Hold. Interesting. So we'll uh, take a look out. All right. Well, uh, you know, thanks a lot. A lot of interesting conversation, some great information. We really appreciate you joining us. Uh, Steve Burns, you can check his stuff out, newtraderu.com. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Mike. Thank you. All right. We'll talk to you later.